you've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Close for Cairo, Legacy Wealth Management, Posture Screen, Cairo Thin, Imaging Services, Zingit Solutions, Peter Goldman's Zone School of Healing, Everest Coaching Systems, Universal Tractioning Systems, Rhino Coaching, Chiropractic Jobs Online, and Cairo Matchmakers. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 76 of Cairo Hustle. I'm your co-host Luke Millette. Here's your host, Jim Chester. So today we have the opportunity of interviewing Dr. Amy Haas. And if you want to know more about how science and research intermingles in the chiropractic space, stay tuned. So Dr. Amy, tell us your chiropractic story and what uh, kind of like influenced you to become a chiropractor? I came to chiropractic from a very different angle than many people. While many of my classmates had grown up with chiropractic, were from chiropractic families, have been brought in by extended family, no one in my family was anywhere near chiropractic. Actually, most of my family was very much against it. Um, I went to a chiropractor for the classic reason. I had a dysfunctional spine and pain in my lower back. And the first time I was adjusted, it was an amazing experience of weight. That restored my function. There's something to this. And that was the first time that I recognized there was anything of validity to chiropractic. And I I use that word very deliberately. Um, Past that point, when that door opened, it has been a continual exploration to understand more and more about chiropractic. And that's what I bring to chiropractic that's very different, is the viewpoint of a former skeptic from a, um, an allopathic traditional family. Um, I'm traditionally trained as a research scientist. So I look at everything with a critical eye. Um, and as a principled chiropractor driven by philosophy, for someone to come to that position from the uh, standpoint of a, of a critic and a scientist and a naysayer, the distance between point A and point B is pretty great there, you can imagine. So what would you say makes you unique in the chiropractic world? Are you doing anything different from everybody else? Since I don't know exactly what everyone is doing, that would be a somewhat difficult question to answer and also because we all do things differently. No one's really right or wrong. There's just different variations on how to approach. My approach is definitely uh, unique unto itself because of my training as a scientist. Anytime I approach a a human being um, with a problem with their spine and nervous system, I'm going to ask the question, what is the underlying problem, just like anyone else? And then I'm going to gather some baseline data, just like many other chiropractors, and then I'm going to um, fit together a puzzle of what I think is going on with per- the person. And then that's where my approach is going to be a little bit different than many people. I will experiment with different adjustments on a person until I find what elicits a response in the patient's neurostructure. And I'm going to use the four magic words here, as measured by what? I fully respect an age. My goodness gracious, I fully respect an eight. And yet, as a healthcare practitioner, I want to make sure that I am eliciting a response from the body and from an eight that I can see and feel and trace to ensure that I'm helping the person head in the right direction, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that's something different that I bring. I guess if I could ask the question in a different way, uh, you were one of the speakers at Mile High this year, right? Do you do other speaking engagements? Do you do you advertise yourself as a public speaker? How often do you do things like that? Not really often. I'm actually a very private person, and um, I've spoken at a couple of very select events where I want to support the mission of those who are putting on the event. So, for example. Um, Scotty Garber and Daniel Knowles and um, John Johnson Bertaramay, they're bringing something great to their community, to their world, and that's something that I want to support. 
Am I, would I advertise myself as a chiropractic speaker? No, there are plenty of people who can do that wonderfully. And I, I, I think I'm going to leave that to people who really are excellent at it. I will pitch in as I can, but I'm by no means the expert and I don't want to be. Well, just for my two cents, I thought you did a great talk and I think more speaking engagements could be really cool, but that's totally up to you. Thank you. Can I tell you a little secret about my life? Sure. Um, did I mention at the time I had, a, I know I spoke with Jim about this, I had a, uh, a mild TBI about a, six weeks prior. I was having post-concussive syndrome that week. Oh, wow. I could, I could hardly see straight. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I almost fell over on stage. There was at one point I was having... Uh, an anxiety episode and I'm like Amy get it together so thank you very much for your feedback I'm glad I was able to fake it well (laughs) (laughs) yeah that makes it even more admirable that you did such a great speaking job I have no idea what I said (laughs) (laughs) well I I think turning the conversation a little bit of how you've been able to um, mesh research and science with chiropractic. I know you're doing some really cool stuff and one of the topics I remember you talking about um, heavily was HRV, which is heart rate variability. And that's something that measures outcomes. And I know you being a scientist and a researcher, that's probably something that speaks to your, it's in your wheelhouse to communicate that to people. So um, can we talk a little bit about uh, heart rate variability and outcomes with chiropractic? I'd love to, and I'm going to actually um, take that and I'm going to grow it a little bit with you so we can see where that fits into a bigger picture. Uh, According to Stevenson's 33 Principles, one of the main functions of intelligence is to enhance the body's ability to adapt to its environment, to use universal forces to maintain our bodies in a state of optimal health and adaptability. So if that is the purpose of chiropractic, adaptability, then as chiropractors, what do we want to be measuring as outcomes? Adaptability. (laughs) So what are some of the objective ways that we can do that? There are several different, uh, you know, possibilities that come to the top of my head. Uh, Paraspinal thermography is an excellent way to monitor adaptability. If a person shows a consistent pattern on either their Titron or their um, Insight scan or their Neuroscope scan, that indicates a physiology that is um, restricted in its dynamic ability to adapt. So having a pattern means you're not adapting onto itself. So that's one way to measure adaptability. That's kind of a binary, is it there or is it not? Then you can think about quantitative ways that can show you in a more linear fashion. Are you adapting better? Are you adapting worse? One classic way to do that is actually in exercise physiology. You can measure how long it takes for someone's heart rate to restore to its normal resting level after an intense workout. The um, duration of time that it takes the body to restore to resting physiology is a reflection of how well the body is adapting to its environment. So that's another classic test for adaptability. Um, And then, of course, heart rate variability is something that, as a scientist, has caught my interest because it ties together the idea of adaptability, which is quantifiable, measurable. It ties Stevenson's 33 principles and the purpose and philosophy of location and correction of vertebral subluxation-driven chiropractic. It ties all of that to a huge scope of literature in the greater science realm that supports us. So do you have any favorite mantras or motivational quotes that keep you fired up about what you do? Mine is really simple. Give the body what it needs, take away what it doesn't, and give the body time. And I'm going to add to that. So give the body what it needs, take away what it doesn't, give the body time, and get the hell out of the way. <laughs> That's a good one. I just work here. I'm, I'm a catalyst. You know, it's innate intelligence that does the healing. I just help to promote a situation where that's possible. 
Yeah, and I found that that's a lot of the times with uh, chiropractic and people getting cares, getting them to the point where their body is able to receive care. And I think that a lot of times people, um, their bodies are in a very high level state of uh, flux with uh, stress and a very high level uh, state of flux with, you know, past injuries and the way that it's been contorted and healed itself up. And then uh, most people are dehydrated and highly inflamed. So getting people to have the optimal body to actually put uh, chiropractic into the nervous system and allowing the body to respond to it, I'm sure that that is the greatest outcome is taking what doesn't belong out and giving the body what it needs and then getting the hell out of the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that, like you're talking about, has to be done in layers with the greatest respect for where the person is. So, so it all, the, the definition of rapid change to the body is not correction. The def, definition of rapid change to the body is trauma. So by definition, any corrective process with the body has to be done stepwise and gradually. So how do you think chiropractic as a profession might improve or change if more doctors had a heavier background in science like, like yourself? In my own experience, my patients tend to respond really well to something they can connect with, not just on an emotional level, but also on a just a, a mental, kinesthetic. You hit all of the different ways into the brain, and as a scientist, I am with every adjustment. I am um, here's where you are. Deliver an adjustment and retest. Can you see a difference? Can you feel a difference? Do you know there's a difference? If every single adjustment, the patient could get off the table and say, this changed, then that brings an accountability to the adjustment. And if, um, if we all did that, if we were all able to really communicate what has changed in the patient's, not just pain, but physiology, is the patient breathing better? Does the patient uh, walk easier? Does the patient feel less stress in their body? Um, if we were all to do that, we could connect patients with the outcome rather than the pain. So based on that answer, do you think it would be beneficial if chiropractic schools started teaching more about the, the science end of it and the research end? That has to be done carefully because it is very easy to tie a person's brain into pathology rather than function. And you can focus on fixing pathology or you can focus on promoting cellulogenesis. However the outcome is expressed, really, in my opinion, should be towards your body's functioning better, better as measured by XYZ as compared to I just corrected X, Y, Z. One empowers the body and innate. The other um, places ourselves and our egos in the place of doctor, healer, controller. So any outcome, um, if it is taught in schools, should be taught in a cyanogenic model. So where do you see the chiropractic profession in the next 20 years? That's, um, that's a loaded question. It is. I don't know if I have a perspective to really answer that well. I know many other people who've been in the profession for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and have seen the trends, the things that come and go, and the underlying themes. There are many people who could answer this question much better than I could. But I'll try to answer that from my perspective of someone who came to chiropractic from the outside, who has been in active practice for 10 years. We're in a heap of trouble. We are in a heap of trouble. And I'm afraid that the flame that is chiropractic may be, someone might be aiming a uh, fire hose at it. And if those of us who truly care about 
the roots of the profession, location and correction of vertebral subluxation. If those of us who really care about the profession could stop the infighting and could really create a unified front, we could make some change. And I'm really afraid that's not going to happen. I'm really afraid that's not going to happen. And that makes me very sad because this profession, our end of the profession, has something truly unique to offer to the world. And for infighting to prevent us from offering our gift to the world is heartbreaking. Yeah, you know, me being somebody that isn't... uh you know, licensed as a chiropractor, I understand the peril of uh, what's happening inside of the, you know, the higher education all the way down to the way the state associations become um, wiggled into more medical modeled. And, you know, even when it came to the point where chiropractors had to become medically board certified to actually practice chiropractic, um, that was, a, I think, a change for uh, the wrong direction. And, you know, we can all travel down the insurance path of how that went and how chiropractors became involved in it and how that went. <laughs> and then each step of the way when chiropractors removed, you know, themselves from actually calling themselves chiropractors to um, chiropractic medicine. I think all those things. Yeah, exactly. It makes you want to like, you know, vomit at your mouth. Yeah. But when we talk about it, it's. The truth of the matter is that the house is burning down a little bit and we're watching it. And yep. uh, I think that, you know, shame on uh, the people that can't get it together and to support each other and to know that we're all on the same team. Um, and then again, we have big guys that are out there watching the chiropractors quibble with each other and uh, be snarky towards each other's whatever it might be, the school, the technique, the, the group that you run with. Um, the powers that be are out there watching, and they're just wringing their hands saying, yes, the plan is working, the chiropractors don't like each other, and uh, we're watching it burn down around with them, and they're, they're happy to see that, I think. So, you know, anybody listening to this should uh, call up five of your chiropractic friends and uh, ask them how they're doing and if there's anything you can do to support them, I think. And I think it has to be, like we discussed in the past, a grassroots level approach. And chiropractors have to be true to each other, number one. But there has to be a vision. What is the outcome? What is the outcome that chiropractors want? And I think that that's something that has to penetrate the consciousness of the chiropractic profession. What does the chiropractic profession want that is vertebral subluxation-based, that is innate intelligence um, scoped, and that believes in those things? What is the chiropractic profession going to deliver to themselves? I think that's the bigger question, is what will the chiropractic profession accept? What will they accept for themselves as the course of the profession changes? Because obviously we all have to um, understand that uh, the anything that we're involved with is in a state of flux. So right now we are at a, in a state of flux where we have to say chiropractors principled um, have to come to this realization that they have to stand up for each other. And that has to stand up for the big idea, which is the chiropractic profession. Otherwise, you said um, it's it's not healthy to to look down the path and see what might become. I would really love to see just across the board, all of us set aside any ego, any personal agenda, and say, what's more important here, me or the profession? and really focus on the profession in ways we can band together rather than shoot each other down. If we actually did that, if we actually banded together on a common platform, on a common goal, I mean, we've got enough people with passion in our, in our profession that we could make the world turn. <laughs> There's not lack of money or resources from the chiropractic profession. It's just lack of stability and unity. So we're going to turn the page here a little bit and talk about marketing a little bit. 
<laughs> How do you use uh, media to your advantage, whether it be social or traditional? Here's where you're totally going to laugh. <laughs> I'm so swamped in my practice right now that in, um, I made a, a, an essential error in constructing my practice. I grew faster than I could create infrastructure. And the infrastructure that I have not created is a social media platform and a social media strategy. Um, I put up the occasional post on Facebook, on our Facebook page, and I have a website, and that's about it. Well, it sounds like that's all you need right now. Uh, yeah, it, my, my patient influx is driven by referrals, and those referrals are driven by results. I've always worked by the premise, do the right thing and people will talk. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Close for Cairo, Legacy Wealth Management, Posture Screen, Cairo Thin, Imaging Services, Zingit Solutions, Peter Goldman's Zone School of Healing, Everest Coaching Systems, Universal Tractioning Systems, Rhino Coaching, Chiropractic Jobs Online, and Cairo Matchmakers. Let's hustle. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's great when there's certainty in the market to where, you know, you don't have to fish in the same ponds the way other people fish. And I think that that's something to be said about a referral-based practice. And, you know, it's it could also be said that, hey, you have an awesome referral-based practice. Why don't you do more and do social media and hire some people to help you? <laughs> so it could be taken either way. <laughs> there's an argument for that. And um, I've got so much on my plate right now that I really need to kind of contract where I am and identify the areas that I really want to focus my energy and um, any kind of marketing program was probably something I should do. <laughs> it's on my list. It's on my list. Yeah. Right, right up there. With, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> So do you have like a type of referral rewards program or is everyone just referring other people because you're that good? Well, I, I thought about doing a referral rewards program with Starbucks cards and then I used them all. So <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work so well. Um, no, I don't. I, I have to. Oh, God. When's the last time I did that? No, it's just ask people to, you know, if they have someone that they know of, um, you know, I'm here. Awesome. So do you have a favorite app or technology to keep you engaged with your audiences? I do use Facebook to put up, you know, some uh, promotional, not even promotional, just inspirational uh, posts every now and again to help people focus on their health, focus on what they can be doing to promote their health. I don't really use those to gain patients at all. That's more about connecting with the patients that I do have. My practice is much more about retention and less about gaining new patients. So I do use social media platforms to engage existing patients and, you know, keep them, um, up to date, um, and part of the family. And I, this isn't a scripted question, but I'm just interested. Um, if you were to recommend people out there that were listening to this podcast episode, um, who would you recommend people to kind of trend with and follow in the chiropractic space? People you think they're doing a really good job, whether they're doing um, coaching or marketing or seminars or strategy for chiropractors, who would you say are some good people to keep your eyes on? That's going to be an interesting political question because, unfortunately, um, I am at the crossroads between two groups of people that I respect very highly that have had a falling out. Um, so, that said, I am a board member of the Mass Alliance for Chiropractic Philosophy. And everyone in that group, these are my friends, my people, my family, my mentors. And um, Pam Jarbo, Peter Kevorkian, uh, Seth Levine, 
and um, Patty Giuliano, particularly with the um, Le- uh, the League of Chiropractic Women. So these are my people, and I know their hearts are in the most wonderful place, and they're geared towards bringing the chiropractic profession to a wonderful place. And I am also um, mentored to some extent by um, Sean Dill and Lacey Book and Liam Schubel and especially Jack Borla. I love Jack. Um, <laughs> hi, Jack. I love you. So, um, and I know that each of those people is looking to do something wonderful for chiropractic. So those are the people that I have been following and listening to as I'm learning more lessons on my own journey about how to become the best chiropractor that I can. And we have, um, probably in the past year and a half, there's been a series of uh, movements in the women's chiropractic movement that are just absolutely stinking awesome to watch women finding their voice and saying, hey, we have a perspective that we have something of value that we want to share with other people. Um, so there are um, Women DC and then Barbara Eaton's group, um, they're, they're just a series of fantastic groups that are coming together to support each other in a way that is constructive. So those those are some groups that I follow. No, that's great input, and thank you for sharing so openly. And I know it's hard to talk about when, uh, you know, we don't always agree with the activities that other people choose to believe and do in. So, it's it's uh, it's hard when you know there's uh, a hard answer to to a simple question, and uh, you know I, I do recommend people that are are listening to you know find out your tribe and you know find out do you investigate listen to people, um, go to seminars listen to people from stage get to know them personally before you uh, jump on what we could say the bandwagon with this person's agenda or this person's coaching. I would say everybody make your most informed decision on who you find to be the people that you resonate with and build your own Cairo tribe a little bit and support each other. And don't aim the guns at the other tribes. (laughs) Yes. And uh, be nice and tell people you like them and uh, shake hands and hug people and be be nice. (laughs) Respectful and allowing that each person has their own journey, their own path and their own perspective. And people aren't necessarily wrong. We just have different ways of doing things. I just wanted to say uh, we also love Jack, too. (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about you a little bit. What do you like to do in your spare time? Are, Are you in the middle of any good books right now? What do you like to listen to? I know you like to cook. And you're into yoga. I really like sleeping. I'd like to get more sleep in the company. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, sleep is my, one of my favorite things. Um, so, me. I'm just me. Um, I love playing outside. I am in... Um, so, New Hampshire has 48 4,000 foot mountains. I've been hiking those for years, and I'm at number 40. So, and myself and my dog, Sagan, who's six and a half, are at number 47 out of 48, and we have been thwarted by winter. Um, <laughs> yeah, kind of frustrating. So next spring, we'll finish up that 48. Um, I, anything outside playtime, I love to do. And then, of course, cooking and yoga and traveling, um, exploring different places, and connecting with people from many different walks of life. One of the things that I bring to chiropractic that is unique is that I went to college in a small private liberal arts college in Maine, Bates, Bates College, and I have most of my friends from um, my immediate classmates from Bates. I mean, this is a bunch of very motivated people. Um, A lot of my friends are uh, MDs, DOs, dentists, lawyers. across the board. So non-chiropractic perspective. So I can mine their brains anytime and say, hey, what do you think about this? And have just open conversations because that's how we were trained to think is a debate and discuss and explore rather than attack. So um, my friends from Bates, my friends from grad school round one, I have a lot of friends who are um, 
they have their own research labs. I have friends who are um, tenured professors at various colleges across the nation. So um, I love connecting with people from very different walks of life to explore what makes them tick. How can people share things in a way that is cohesive and coherent and builds bridges rather than um, builds walls? So that, that's something I love doing. I, my, my crazy group of friends and my strands of fabric that go all over the place and, you know, places you'd never expect. So I have to ask, what's your favorite thing to cook? Bacon. Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> I've got bacon in my fridge right now. Bacon. Did I mention bacon? Um, maybe some bacon. You know something funny? I have a lot of uh, vegetarian and vegan friends, but they all say the same thing. Damn, I miss bacon. <laughs> yeah, I would believe that. I have met many veg- vegetarian friends, too, and, you know, when I cook for them, I'm like, I, uh, maybe I could just throw some bacon in that. No, maybe <laughs> Maybe I could just cook that up in bacon fat. No, Amy, that's disrespectful. Don't do that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, favorite things to cook. Blueberry crisp, bacon, bacon, roasted chicken. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm getting hungry. Chipotle? <laughs> I like to cook Chipotle too. <laughs> you like to go to Chipotle. <laughs> I'm getting hungry now too. I think something I'm gonna cook in the course of the next week is bison bacon chili. Oh, um, paleo wow. bison bacon chili. Uh, oh, I'm getting hungry. That sounds amazing. <laughs> how how did a chiropractic podcast turn to a cooking show? <laughs> Because bacon. Bacon. <laughs> well, we're actually coming up on the tail end of this episode. What are some uh, social media or website links you can give people if they wanted to reach out to you or learn more about you? Um, well, I'm boring, but um, Cairo Nerds is something that Bruce, and, Bruce Steinberg and Jen Steinberg and I have been creating. It's still kind of in the early development process where we're hoping to create a resource to bring relevant scientific findings from the outside scientific literature that are um, that relate to chiropractic and translate it in a way that means something to us as practitioners that we can um, translate to our patients. So Chiro Nerds is, we, let's see, we spell it weird. It's C-H-I-R-O-N-E-U-R-D-S. Uh, dot com, and we have both a Facebook page and a regular website, and the spelling is all Bruce's fault. <laughs> <laughs> so, other than bacon, is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to ask you? If there was one thing I would offer to people as they're thinking about patient care, to think about how their care is perceived by the patient and is the patient getting what they came there for um, and as measured by what? Four magical words that could be applied across the board to results-driven chiropractic as measured by what? I'm, I'm I'm improving your adaptability as measured by what? I'm improving your health, improving your health as measured by what? Um, I'm bringing more life to your years and years to your life as measured by what? So if we can work on those four little words and answering those questions, we can strengthen ourselves from the inside out and by holding ourselves accountable in a way that is more easily digested by our patient population. Yeah, I just came back from uh, Dan Bay's Close for Cairo Masterclass in Chicago. And one thing he was really trying to incite in people is measurable results. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tangible, measurable results. I, I forget what the five senses are. I know um, auditory, visual, kinesthetic, whatever the five senses are. And I think Dan talks about this a little bit. Did he talk about that this past weekend? Um, I don't remember because I was filming also, so I couldn't 
pay attention to everything, but he may have. That, that's one thing to keep in mind, as measured by what, and you think about how to how a person perceives you, hitting each of those five senses um, to make sure that you're connecting with the patient. And I agree too, um, and I think that that's a really good place to uh, say um, we appreciate you uh, sharing with us and um, opening up some minds as to um, what their chiropractor is actually doing and uh, how the perception of the chiropractic um, patient base is actually viewing what they get. And I think that that's a, a real important conversation as we go forward as to what are you delivering and what is the person getting. And I think that a lot of times people are really interested in outcome. Whenever it comes to anything that they're dealing with, um, people want to find out why do I continue and what's in it for me. So I think what you said is really important. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Dan and Sean and Jen with Close for Cairo for being an amazing sponsor of the Cairo Hustle podcast. Um, they were one of our first uh, sponsors, so thank you. Um, it's great to bring them up in our cultural conversation of chiropractic because they are doing great work out there helping so many people with their systems to um, get people into offices and keep them under care because I think that that's one of the um, greatest challenges for all chiropractors is selling the most beautiful profession. I have not taken their workshops yet. That's the reason I didn't bring them up and recommend them because I haven't personally experienced them. I've had a ton of my friends who have been who've gone through their master class and gotten great, holy crap, great results from their work. And uh, their master class is something I'm intending to take next year, actually. Yeah, I'm learning how to close. I'm not even a doctor. It applies to anything. It's psychology. Well, that pretty much wraps up this episode. I want to thank you so much for being on our show today. Jim and I had a lot of fun with you. Thank you for, for having me. I hope I've contributed something. Bacon. <laughs> Bacon. Yeah, you're a lot of fun, and I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to share with us today in our audience because uh, you're right. There is a big voice for the women chiropractor, and your contribution is necessary, so thanks for stepping up and sharing. Thank you for having me, and I'm glad to, glad to share. And we just want you to enjoy the rest of your day, okay? Will do. You guys, too. We will. <laughs> see you, Amy. Okay, see you later. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.